there is no class next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is July 4th. And there's no class. All right. Um, so have fun, and we'll be back on the 6th, which is a week from today. So you get a little mini summer break in there. Um, it's funny, I teach two days a week, and whenever the 4th of July like, doesn't fall on one of the days that I teach, um, I, I feel like I've been cheated out of a holiday, even though I'm only working two days a week anyhow. You know, I don't know, I guess you get greedy at a certain point. What this means is, is this, uh, that this is the last class session before your design is due. Okay, so if you have questions about the design, it would be good for you to ask them now or in lab. If you have started your design, it would be a good idea to show it to me in lab, and it would be a good idea to show it to other people in lab. Um, it's a good way to sort of exchange ideas. You can find out what they're doing. You can uh, show what you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's a win-win situation, and, and hopefully everyone can benefit from that. Um, sometimes it takes another set of eyes to look at something and, and give you some feedback on it. What may seem very clear to you might not be uh, clear to other people. So, are there any questions about the design document that you need to perform, or prepare, rather, create? Four sections, or I'm sorry, five sections, four of them in Word or a word processing document. Be sure that whatever you turn in is a standard format, something that I can open up on any machine, so no Visio documents, PDFs, Word document, Google Docs, all those are fine uh, options. Uh, open Office is good as well. Uh, and then there will be uh, a set of web pages and CSS files that form your prototype. Remember, a prototype doesn't have to be finished, but it should be finished enough for me to look at it and get an idea of what, um, what the page is supposed to look like, what your site is supposed to look like. So that design is due on Thursday of next week, and I will aim to get you feedback quickly on that so that you can continue and finish the project up. Um, you know, I told you that, uh, I told you when we started this class that summer classes go by very quickly. You know, we're at the halfway point. It seems like we just started, right? But we're at the halfway point. And uh, uh, the design is due next week, and then just, what, like three weeks later, the final project is due. So you don't have tons of time. Um, does anyone care to share what topic they picked for their project? and or where they are at on the design process. And please be honest. Don't tell me, well, I'm going to do this and I'm halfway through the prototype, you know, if you haven't started it, you know. Uh, my aim is, my, uh, I'm not, I'm not um, how do I want to say this? I'm not doing this to like try to interrogate you. I want to see where you're at and see what I can do to help you to complete that. So anyone care to share what they're going to do on the project? Yes. Okay. Okay, so a guide, a guide uh, to paddle boarding. Um, where are you as far as the design process goes? Uh, I started putting together the... Uh, right. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Anyone else? Does anyone not have a topic? Don't be embarrassed if you don't. Okay, so 
you're going to keep me in suspense then until next Thursday. That's fine. That's fine. I like surprises. So we'll see next Thursday uh, how that goes. By all means, ask. Send it to me in advance. Um, remember the curve that I drew as far as the cost to correct uh, something. Uh, when you're designing software, you want to get the design correct because you want it, uh, you want it to be as correct as possible without spending, uh, so, so that therefore fixing it won't require a lot of changes. With your prototype, your goal is to just make a model of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. All right. Does anyone have questions over any of the CSS stuff that we went over last time? We've gone over a lot of CSS stuff as far as positioning goes. And it's important that you understand that. And I want you to understand all of them, but the one that I want you to understand most is floating. All right, so if you don't understand floating, um, by all means, ask. Any questions about floating something? All right, excellent. Um, I'm going to look at a problem with one of the designs that I did. And we're going to discuss ways that we can fix it. All right? So, and this is sort of a problem with fixed layouts. Again, we went over fixed layouts because it's important that you at least understand how they work because you might be working on a site that uses them. Um, generally speaking, uh, floating layouts and more flexible layouts are, are better um, because they're more versatile. But again, there is a need sometimes to do floating layouts. And here's the problem that I want to look at. Here's our page. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I don't see a problem. Well, until we get to the 60s page. Because remember, everything in the CSS file is nailed down to a certain position. So our footer, if we were to look at it, our footer in this design is at top of 570, left of 10. All right? Well, that's perfectly good on this page because the footer goes down below the content. But when we get to the 60s page, notice what happens. We have those things overlap. All right, let's brainstorm some things we could do to fix this. Let's come up with a couple ideas. I can think of three things off the top of my head to fix this. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can come up with other options. How could we fix this? Here's the most straightforward change we could make. Just make this a bigger number. Right now it is 570. Well, let's try 770. All right, that's not big enough. Let's try 870. Yeah, we could still go down a little further. So let's make it 920. Okay, so now that page is good. What problem do you think we're going to have, though? When we go back to this page, it's going to be a big gap between there and the footer. So it's not quite as bad as it overlapping, but that might not be the best solution. All right? So one thing we could do is just give that a, a certain size. All right? Now, uh, just give it a bigger size. So let's go back to where it was before. What was it before, originally? 570? Yeah. What's something else we could do? Yes? Repeat that, please. Clone the CSS and give the 60s their own. I like that. Kind of. All right? So we could do that, right? I could do this. Let's go. And let's save this as main 60 CSS. 
All right? And then I can make that one 920. And now, the home page is right. Oh, I have to change the 60s page. I created a style for it, but I didn't. I'm still linking to the old style. So, let's go here. And I'll change this to main two. Oh, I call it main sixty. All right. So now, yeah, I'm back. Back in business, the 60s one looks correct, and the home page still looks correct. So that's a, that's a pretty good idea. What's a drawback with that strategy? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, that if we get to a certain point, if I had to make that adjustment, like let's say on a bunch of other pages, if I had to do the 50s and the 70s and so on, or even with this, I now have to change two things if I want to change anything in the basic style. So for example, let's say I want the color of the text to be blue. All right. I could go into main 60 CSS and say, color blue. And that changes that page, but it doesn't change the original page. So by having multiple CSS pages where only one thing varies, um, and it's a clone, is not necessarily, uh, uh, it is good because it gets the job done, but it's bad because you now have lost a little bit of the benefit of having all your CSS in one file. What's another thing that we could do? I didn't even think of cloning the CSS. That's a good alternative as well. Yeah. Okay. I could redesign the page. I could say, look, this is this is a pain. This is a drawback of doing uh, this. So I could just redesign the page and let's get rid of the main sixty again. Let's put it back to main. I could fairly easy go into here and maybe make the width of this guy. I'll make it 400. I'll make the footer with 200, and I'll make top 130. Left 240. So I could just redesign my page. Oh, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. The left should be like, yeah, I could do right 10, too. True. In fact, let's do that. Uh, that's the only problem with that is we'll have overlap if the screen's too small. That's why I prefer like to do like left of. If I do left of, I gotta add left of 680 pixels. Oh, I did 690, but that's good enough. And that'll sort of do the same thing. 
and it puts it there. So that's another thing I could do, is I could redesign my page so now it doesn't matter how long that is. It doesn't go below it, and everything is sort of back to normal. That's another, that's another good solution. What's well, another thing we could do? I feel like uh, DJ Khaled, another one. What's another one? Another one. What's another one that I could do? Pardon me? Um, how, how so? Okay. That's one thing we could possibly do. Um, the only problem with that is, is if we try to do that, let's see, I want to get this back to normal. Let me do one more undo, I think, or two more. Okay, so now we're back to here. So we're back to that problem. Watch what happens if I take the position out of this. I'm going to take position absolute out of that. Where is it going to appear now? It's going to appear at the very top of the page, because if there's no position, where does it go? It goes in the flow. So if I were to do a relative position for this, I would still have to do relative a big number on this page, relative a smaller number on this page. All right. What we can do is we can go and create a second CSS. Now how is this different than your suggestion of a clone? My second CSS is not going to have everything in it. It's just going to have the one thing in it. So I could do this. I could go on my 60s page, and I could put underneath my CSS file, I could put style. And I could say footer top. What did I make it? 920 px, right? All right, and I could do that. All right. Now let's see what this does. In this case, my web page has two CSS files associated with it, or two pieces of CSS code, because this is in, this is not in a separate file. It has this, and it has this. All right. And if I do that then, the index page only has the one. So it gets the old top of 570. The 60s page on here gets ah, gets a mess. What did I do wrong? My page disappeared. Ah, you see, I think I'm almost at that point in my teaching career where I can pretend like I made this mistake on purpose to test you guys' thinking. Uh, a couple more years' experience, and I'll be able to pull it off. What did I do wrong? Here's the code. Well, can you guess it? I, I flash the code up there for a second. Can you guess it without seeing the code? Let's look at the code then. What? No end style. All right. I put a start style and I put a start style there. So the effect is, is everything on the page the browser thinks is CSS code. It's wrong CSS code, but it thinks it's CSS code. So the correction for this is that. Sort of like the same thing I did with the title before. And now we are back to normal. And this one now has the top of 920. All right, so we changed it just on this one page. Now, if we had a bunch of pages, if we had some pages that were short and some pages that were long, all right, we could make a second CSS file, CSS2, and have in that CSS file just this. All right, just this. Now, there's one other thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it just because sometimes you see it in code, but I hate it. All right, 
is you actually could put CSS on the HTML element like this. You can say style equals like that. And then you can get rid of this. And that'll work the same. Oh, that's off a little bit. It should be, I put what, 920? Let's put 940. Okay, now, what did we learn from this? We learned something that's going to become very important in a few minutes here when we start talking about mobile websites, making a website compatible for mobile. So what we learned is that you can have two pieces of CSS code that apply to you can have two pieces of CSS code that apply to a page. Oh, I didn't have a page for the 70s. That's right. You can have two pieces of CSS code that applies to a page. Um, one, well, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. You have two pieces of CSS code that applies to the page. We're going to learn, when we talk about mobile stuff, uh, uh, some techniques that will allow you to sometimes apply one CSS file and sometimes apply another CSS file. All right. And that's going to be key when we start talking about mobile devices. But for right now, our breakthrough is that we can write different CSS code depending on the page. All right? So we don't have to redo the whole CSS file. We can just write our additions and either put it in a file or put it as part of the page. All right? There's one other thing that we could do. All right? And I wouldn't expect you to know this one, but. I could give a height to this and set the overflow property. What's the overflow property? It will give a scroll bar to that section of the screen. And I never remember what this is, so I have to look it up every time. Again, this is, you know, whenever I teach a class, I, I try to tell people that it's impossible to memorize everything. All right? Um, but know the main concepts and know the stuff that you use often. So, for example, you shouldn't have to look up how to set the background color of something, right? You might have to look up a specific code for a color or whatever, but like if you're struggling with that and you have to look up every little single thing, then you're not going to be effective as a web developer. But certain things that you don't use often, yeah, just remember that they exist and look them up. Like the overflow is something that you can set. So, I can go and set an overflow property to say scroll. So I could do this. I could give a height to the main section in addition to a width. So I could say height, you know, maybe 400 pixels. And I could say overflow, overflow scroll. And what that will do is if it's bigger than 400, you can scroll it. So, for example, this one is bigger than 400. Take out that code. And so it will allow you to scroll that. 
So it all depends. You have all these choices. You know, part of your job as a designer is looking at all these things, having them all in your toolbox, and deciding which is appropriate in which case. All right. Um, so that's sort of a drawback with fixed is that if, you, if you're positioning certain elements on the page, they're going to be nailed down there. And if a page is a little bit different, you have to do something to accommodate that. I'm going to look at, we're going to do one more thing with CSS before we start talking about mobile uh, development. And that is, we're going to look at prototype, the last prototype that we did, the floating one. And we're again going to look at the 60s page. Because it might be nice if these albums were side by side. I mean, you can even imagine. We can even, you know, we could even get a picture of the album if we wanted to. But it would be nice if these album information were side by side instead instead of stacked horizontally, or instead of stacked vertically rather, to stack them horizontally. Now, there's any number of ways that we could do that. All right. We're going to do that using float as well. Um, and if we, well, yeah, we could probably do something like this with relative positioning. But since I'm, I, I want to stress floating, we'll use floating to do this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in to this. Oops. And I shouldn't have to edit this at all, the HTML. But I'm going to pull up the HTML up so I can look at some stuff in it. There's an article that has a class of band, and there's an article that has a class of album. Remember that we have studied three main ways that you can apply a style to something. And, and those we called selectors, right? We had a selector for HTML tags. So I could make every article look a certain way. I could make every H2 look a certain way. All right, I could make every link look a certain way. We refine that a little further by putting, in, by putting two HTML tags together. So we said nav A, which meant that any link within a nav tag got a certain style rule. So that was another kind of HTML selector that we've done. The other two selectors that we did is we did a selector for class and for ID. And a selector for class is what you use when there's likely to be more than one thing on the page that is like it. So for example, there's going to be there's a potential to have multiple albums on a page. So I would not use an ID for album. All right. And I wouldn't do something like make a, an ID for album one, make an ID for album two, album three, because then I'd have to set the style for all of those IDs. It's much better to say a class. Anything that I call belonging to the class of album, I want to treat a certain way. Now, we did talk about the other way, which is with credits, where that is if we know for sure that there's only going to be one thing on the page that is like it. So in this case, there's only one place on the page to put the credits. I'm going to put all my credits in that section, and therefore, I can assign an ID to it. All right. So what I can do for album is I can first of all give it a width of 40%. You might wonder why, if I want two of them side by side, why I, do, why I don't do 50%. The reason for that is because you have to take into account that the margin and the padding add on to that. All right? If I give a width of 50%, I'm going to make each of them smaller, but they're not going to be side by side. So the one's here, the one's here. Now to make them side by side, what? What I'm going to do in a minute is I'm going to float them. But before that, let's look. 
When I give a width of 40%, 40% of what, I guess is a question. If we look at this, it's not 40% of the whole screen. That's way less than 40% of the screen. It's 40% of this area. So when I give a percentage size for something, it is going to be the percentage of whatever contains it. So in this case, the album article is inside the band article, which is inside the section. So the section has a width of 60%. And I do not give, or, or do I? I do not give a size for the band article. So the section is 60% of the page. This is 40% of that section. So this will be approximately 24% of the page. All right? So that makes more sense. It looks about like a quarter of the page. It's not 40% of the whole page. That would be like this wide. So whenever you give a percentage, it's a percentage of the container. All right? Percentage of the container. So now, I should be able to float those. And I can float them to the left. And now they're side by side. Except we have a teensy problem. And that problem is is that now we have a little bit of overlap between the band and the album. Any idea why that is? In a nutshell, I floated one but didn't float the other. Which means that one of them is floated, the other is in the flow. So the way to fix that would be to also float the band to the left. The band class to the left. And that fixes it. All right. Remember, you get, I don't want to say in trouble, because that, that implies uh, something. But um, there's a potential for problems when you set the position of one thing and don't set the position of the other thing. Because remember, if you set the position of, uh, if you do not set the position of something, it will fall into the flow. It will fall into the way the browser wants to put it and you therefore would have to um, address that. Again, notice Jimi Hendrix doesn't go as far across. Maybe I like that. If I don't like that, I could give the band area a percentage and say width 95% maybe. And then it goes all the way across. Now notice as I resize this, whoops, what I do? If I resize this because these things are percentages, they get smaller. All right? And at a certain point, they drop down like that. I could fix any of those little irregularities I run into by giving something a minimum width. So I could say a minimum width of this one of, let's say, 200 pixels. The minimum width is useful for like extreme situations. Like if someone were to go and make their window very, very, very thin, all right? Sometimes some designs sort of fall apart a little bit. 
Well, you can sort of force it from never getting smaller than something by assigning a minimum width. So now if I do that, if I resize it, even at this width, it's like that. If I get too narrow, it pops down like that. Which is not, not bad. I want to show you one other thing. Let's go and get an image uh, from Wikipedia. Or Rubber Soul, the album. Save the image. Not too much going on here. All right, let me copy that image. Put up my images folder. All right, let me go in here. And I'm going to put the image here. Now, Nowhere here in the HTML or in the CSS have I specified how big this image should be. All right? They hire people to go by my classes pushing those carts around. I swear. It's like they test it out and it's like, no, this one isn't noisy enough. Let's get another one. Okay, yeah, that one sounds good. Oh, what did I do wrong? Another one of those intentional mistakes. Right? I put it in the images folder, so I should say images, rubber sole. All right. So I didn't give any size to the image. This image is how big? Let's go and look. I should be able to look at the properties of it and see somewhere here, details. It's 220 by 220 pixels. All right. So. One thing I could do is I could, instead of making a minimum width of, of 200, I could up it to 220, plus a little bit for padding. But I can also specify a percentage for the width of the image. And how do I do that? I can do that via the CSS. Now, do I want to do it to every single image on, my, uh, on this page? Probably not. I want to take every, I want to take the images that are in these album sections and make those be a certain percentage. So I can go into the CSS and I can, just like I could combine HTML tags before, I could say dot album, meaning anything in the album section, that is an image. I can say as a width of 
And then, as I go in, whoops, and change the size of this, the image gets a little bigger or a little smaller. All right. So I can make the width a percentage. Now, a thing to keep in mind, you would not want to make it ex take an extremely large picture and use the width to make it tiny. Because then you're still downloading all the bytes for the gigantic picture. And you're just using your CSS to make it smaller. You also don't want to use HTML, because there's a way to make your HTML make an image smaller. It's best to use CSS for that. All right, But this is a technique, and guess what? What this is going to be good for? It's going to be good for mobile devices. All right, So that if we view this in a mobile device, then um, we have a fighting chance of it looking good. All right, let's go, in fact, and view this using my, one of my emulators. Okay, it really doesn't look that much different. Well, you notice if we, get, if we view it on an iPad, the image gets bigger than if we view it on a iPhone 5. All right. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mobile world. And we're going we're, we're, we're to get you started in the direction of developing sites that are um, that work both on a desktop environment and in a mobile development uh, environment. We're going to talk about a number of things, and then some of the things we're going to discuss in more detail. Some of the things I'm going to say we're, we don't discuss in this class, we discuss in other classes. All right. So first of all, if your organization wants to have a presence in the mobile world, there's two alternatives. All right. You can have an app, and you can have a mobile web page. All right. What strategy, do you, what strategy do you think most companies do? Do most companies have a website that's optimized for mobile, or do most organizations develop an app? Well, they, they do. This is, in a way, this is a trick question. Because the strategy that most of them do is they, they do both, right? For example, eBay, all right? eBay has an app that you can download to your phone, all right? eBay also has a website that's optimized for mobile devices, all right? And the reason for that is they don't want to cut anyone out of the loop. Right? Some people prefer to use, you know, someone that was, let's say, a very active eBay user probably would download the app. All right? Someone like me that very infrequently bids on eBay, but does once in a while, probably wouldn't go to the trouble of downloading the app. You know, sometimes I have space issues on my phone and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to use my web browser. All right? What are some of the advantages of an app compared to a mobile web page. What advantages do an, does an app give you? Well, let's go over some of them, all right? Because um, for, for a lot of these advantages or disadvantages, I can say that there's an advantage to this, but there's a way to sort of make up for that advantage on the, on the uh, website side. An app, first of all, is downloaded to your phone. A mobile website is added through the browser. 
So it doesn't require downloaded, downloading to your site, to, to your device. You can just, you know, I can, even though I don't have the uh, eBay app on this phone, I can go and, and pull up through my web browser, I can pull up the eBay site. All right. Apps have the disadvantage of you have to have multiple versions. Right? Developers have to develop an iPad pod, or not an iPod, an, uh, uh, an iOS, an Apple version, and an Android version. Now to be sure, there are tools that make that job a little easier. But the fact remains that you still have to have two versions of it, regardless of how you create it. Again, there's ways to make that job a little bit easier, but there's tools that, uh, that make it easier, but you still have to develop two versions of the app. With a mobile web page, it should be that anyone that has a web browser can access it. All right? So, should only be one version. You don't need multiple versions for Apple and Android. Apps, however, can be optimized for a given platform. Which means that it can integrate with many of the other features within your phone. For example, um, if you wanted to share a page on eBay with one of your contacts. Like, you know, I see something I think my brother would love. All right? If, I have, if I'm using the eBay app, that's integrated within the Android system. So very easily, I could, with a few clicks, I can go and I can send that to my brother. And he could go and look it up. All right? The reason for that is there's multiple versions. And each version is optimized for the platform. All right? It's very difficult to do that with a mobile website. So things like integrating with the camera um, and all that. Some of those things are possible on a mobile website, but they're much easier to do when you develop uh, an app. Updates. An app must be updated. Now to be sure, there are settings that sometimes your apps are automatically updated. But the fact remains that your app has to be updated. With a website, whoa, need a seatbelt on this chair. With a website, you don't have to update anything. The next time a user visits a site, if the server is updated, they get the newest code. Lastly, what was I thinking? I was thinking of one more thing. Oh, offline. It's easier to do stuff offline in an app. You can allow people to do certain things offline. You can store some things offline. Um, for example, if you're using an offline version of Google Docs, you might be able to download, work on, if you're using the app version of Google Docs, you could probably edit, an, edit a document that you had on your phone, even if you weren't connected to the internet. All right? Certain games you can play if you're offline. Um, whereas a website, typically you would need to be online. There's ways that you can store stuff on a website so that people can visit it offline. But it's generally, offline is a little smoother when you're talking about an app. All right, so we don't talk about apps in this class. All right, so that, that got rid of half the problem for us. All right. Um, there are classes in Android and iOS development where we do talk about developing apps, both for iOS and Android. But we do talk about developing mobile websites. And I'm, I'm using the phrase mobile website, but mobile compatible might be better. Because oftentimes it's just our website. There's nothing special about the mobile version of the site. It's just our website. All right? 
There's a couple of strategies, and your goal here is to make a site that's going to work both on a mobile device and on your desktop device. So, there's a couple of approaches that you can take. Number one, you can develop a, sort of a one-size-fits-all site. It's possible to do that. It's possible to write code that looks acceptable in a desktop browser and also looks acceptable in a mobile browser. It's possible to do that. All right? In which case you have an identical page and it looks okay both on a mobile and a desktop. So you just have one set of code. So you'd have one set of HTML, one CSS, and one set of server-side code. We don't talk about server-side code in this class, but that would be things like ASP.NET or PHP. It's, it's programs that write the web page for you. Okay? For our purposes, we can just talk about, you'd have one HTML and one CSS. A second approach is to have one set of HTML with multiple CSS. All right, we've already seen CSS Zen Garden, and we've seen how easy it is to take a page and reformat it to make it look completely different by simply using a different CSS file. We can actually write code to um, apply one CSS file in one case, apply a different CSS, uh, CSS file in a different case. All right? We can do that. So we're going to have one set of HTML and or one set of server-side code. But we're going to have multiple CSS. And it's going to take the content and display it different ways. We can also, with our CSS code, do some magic to, uh, to make the page have different content if you're on a mobile device or uh, on, a, uh, on a desktop device. The third method is to have two separate sites. Which is separate sets of code. Maybe some code shared. Essentially what you have is when you request a web page from the web server, client requests a web page, the web server, the server has a little traffic cop in it that looks at the request and says, is it a mobile request or is it a desktop request? And it picks which HTML file to send back to the client depending on the platform. eBay is an example of that. Let's go to ebay.com. Here is ebay.com. If I use my phone, to go to ebay.com, we'll notice something very subtle and small happens. I wonder, wonder if the dot cam can pick up my phone. Yeah, not really. But if you have a phone, if you have a smartphone of your own, you can try this out. What I'm looking at is the URL here. The URL is actually different. On the phone, 
it says m.ebay.com. On the desktop, it says www.ebay.com. And if you notice, just at a glance, let's put these two up. Notice how the page is organized a lot differently. We don't have this little slideshow on a mobile device. We don't have popular destinations. We have daily deals and so on and so forth. All right. Now, other, other sites take different approaches. For example, if we were, if we were to go to ESPN.com, It looks to me like the URL didn't change. They both say www.espn.com, and they're essentially the same page. All right? A couple things are different. Notice, for example, there's no scoreboard on, on this one. All right? Uh, on the mobile version. The mobile version, there's no scores going on over the top. There is a navigation. On this one, there's like a scoreboard going across of the, of, you know, the, the most uh, important games of the past day or so. So ESPN either uses, probably doesn't use the first one technique, but probably uses the second technique where there is one base of code that gets applied multiple CSS files to it. Now, which one do you choose? You choose this one if you're lucky. This typically is not going to happen unless you're talking about a very small website. For example, I could think maybe a site for a restaurant. Three or four pages to the site, nothing too elaborate. You might be able to get by with one design that works well in a mobile device and in a desktop device. Any larger site probably isn't going to get away with that. For these two, sort of the criteria is how different do you want the mobile experience than the desktop experience? All right? Because when you're surfing the web via a mobile device, it's different than surfing the web via a desktop device. It's different in a bunch of different ways. All right? First of all, it's different in terms of the physical way that you interact with the site. All right? Compare the size of screens. This is a smaller screen than that. All right. How do I interact with it? I touch it as opposed to using a pointer to go and click on things. What is my internet connection likely to be on this versus a wired uh, machine? Which one's liable to have a quicker internet connection? The desktop or a mobile device? The desktop. Let's put it this way. Never will the mobile device have a quicker connection to the internet than your laptop or desktop. It might have as fast, but it's not ever going to have quicker. Whereas like in a case like this where I'm actually wired into the network, this internet connection is going to be a lot faster than this. All right. The processor of this machine is liable to be much more powerful than the processor of my phone. All these things point to the fact that my website for a mobile device is typically likely to be simpler than my website for a desktop device. If I scroll down a little bit here, notice that at a certain point I get into I lied. Let's pick another one, Amazon. Notice that Amazon, on the desktop version, has multiple columns of stuff. 
whereas the mobile version is for the most part a single column. All right. So as a general rule, because of the limitations of the device and the hardware and the way that you interact with it, uh, a design for a mobile device is likely to be simpler for um, a, uh, a design for um, a desktop device. But it goes beyond that. All right. Because people that are surfing the web using a desktop device or a laptop are sometimes looking for more information or different information than if you're surfing via a mobile device. All right. Let's imagine Learning Community College's website. We're not going to, we're going to, we're just going to imagine it. We're not actually going to look at it. Because I, well, because I don't think it does what I'm going to talk about. All right. Would you be more likely to use a, a desktop computer or a mobile device if you wanted to research um, different major options? Like you're coming here and you know you want to study computers, but you're not sure exactly what you major in. Would you be more inclined to use a desktop machine or a mobile device to do that sort of research? where you're going to spend a fair amount of time on it and you're going to read a fair amount of material. What do you think? Desktop or mobile? Probably a desktop, I would say. What's something that you might use a mobile device to access LC's website to find? They're checking schedules, you know. When is Zeller's office hours? What's his phone number? What's his email address? Um, this is always a good question to ask during uh, winter semester because the obvious answer is I'm going to check on my mobile device to see if the, the campus is closed, right? I'm going to go and see if it's closed or not before I drive in through 10 feet of snow to get here, all right? My point is, is that generally speaking, and again, I'm speaking in very general terms, uh, people that are accessing the web on computers tend to be, um, are likely to do that when, let, let, me, let me flip that around. People who are accessing a website on a mobile device are more likely to have sort of a very pointed question that they want answered. They want some real specific information. They're not going out and doing like a lot of research, all right? Whereas people accessing a site via a desktop is easier in that mode to do maybe more extensive research and look things up and all that. So it's not just the fact that the device is different, it's the fact that the goals of the people are different. So we are able to show and hide different content for a mobile device versus for a desktop device. All right? And we're able to do that just by using CSS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up an example here. By no means is this meant to be a great example. All right? This isn't a beautiful website. But it's a website that, um, that illustrates some of the things that you can do versus mobile uh, versus a desktop. When we start talking about having a website with one set of CSS that looks one way on a mobile and one way on a desktop, we're talking about what's called responsive design. That's sort of a really big buzzword, responsive design. And the idea of responsive design is that your page looks different in different environments. So it's going to look different on mobile versus on a desktop. And there's about three rules, and we've covered all but one of them. All right? Number one is use floating layouts. and use percentages for widths, etc. And these are both for content areas and also for images and videos. 
if you embed like a YouTube video on your page, you can do the same thing I did with the image of giving the YouTube video a percentage of the width instead of a absolute number of 600 pixels wide or whatever. So use these flexible things that we talked about. Floating, not fixed design. Percentages, not hard-coded pixels. And use those percentages for content, images, videos, for everything. The last thing is the new thing that we talk about, and that is what we call a media query. That's the new thing. So in our example, we're going to see what's called a media query. And a media query is where you write code that says when to use style sheet A, when to use style sheet B. All right? So let's look at an example. Okay. Under mobile, there's two styles that you can use when you're developing um, a website that has multiple CSS files. One is called progressive enhancement, the other is called graceful degradation. We'll talk about that. We're going to start with progressive enhancement. Progressive enhancement is the approach that you should take assuming that you're starting from scratch. So if you're developing a site from scratch, all right, um, you should use the progressive enhancement technique. The graceful degradation would be pretty much like someone already has a website that works, but they've been sleeping for the past three years or something, and they don't have a mobile optimized. And they say, hey, we don't want to redo the whole site. We just want to make it mobile compatible. Then you'd use what's called graceful degradation. Progressive enhancement works like this. We're going to start developing a CSS file for mobile devices. We're going to create then a second CSS file that's going to apply only for desktop pages. So let's look at this example. Again, not necessarily a beautiful web page. All right. But if I go and view it in a mobile device, notice, notice nothing up my sleeves. iPhone 5, it looks different. That's the exact same web page. All right, nothing up my sleeve, as they say. So I didn't like switch the URL on you real quick or anything like that. That's the same web page. And as we go and view in these different mobile environments, it looks like that in a mobile uh, in a mobile uh, browser 
it looks like this in a desktop browser. So let's look, let's actually, let's actually open this up in two browsers. So I have two browser windows with the same page in it. And I'm going to make this one show the mobile version. So what are the differences you see right off? All right. Let's, let's, this, oh, this is going to be a good one of them spot the differences puzzles. All right. Well, number one, there's actually uh, a background on the desktop version, a, um, a no background on the mobile version. That's probably a good thing, right, because the mobile version could potentially be a little harder to read, so you wouldn't want a background interfering with it. It's actually a different font in the mobile version. If you notice the desktop version uses a serif font, the mobile version uses a sans serif font. Notice the navigation is oriented differently. All right, the navigation is oriented uh, horizontally on the mobile version. It's oriented vertically in a desktop version. Notice that there are multiple columns in the desktop version. There's a single column in the mobile version. And last but not least, there's an image that appears in the mobile version I'm sorry, in the desktop version, it does not appear in the mobile version. So this is an example of how through CSS we can even change the content that the user sees. The idea being that uh, an image might be less critical in a mobile where you just are interested in the information. You might not really care about the bells and whistles. Uh, this is sort of like, if you remember the which one was it? The eBay one that we went to? Or, or, yeah, the eBay one where there was sort of a, a little slideshow going on that didn't appear in the other one. If they did it with multiple CSSs, they could have done it the same way that we did this. So let's look at the code that makes this happen now that we've noted the differences. With progressive enhancement, You start out with a base CSS file that applies to everyone. Everyone gets the base CSS file. And the base CSS file is the CSS file that gives the look for the mobile device. Progressive enhancement is sometimes called mobile first development because you develop your base CSS to give the mobile its look. So let me go and let me temporarily delete this. I'm going to temporarily delete the second CSS file. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the design for the mobile. So the base CSS file contains the design that we want for the mobile. The second CSS file contains the changes that we want when we go to a desktop browser. So everyone, every browser in the world gets this first base CSS. Only some of the browsers get the desktop CSS. And the, get, the, the desktop CSS contains the changes, the differences between the mobile version of the site and the desktop version of the site. Now, we could actually take this even further if we wanted to. All right? Um, we could write different CSS files for um, a, a, a bare bones flip phone, for a smartphone, for a tablet for a desktop, for a big, gigantic, big screen desktop, you know. We could, we could take this to different levels. Right now we're only doing two levels, mobile and desktop. But each one, the same idea would work, that the first style sheet applies for everyone, the subsequent style sheets only apply under certain cases. 
So how do we make it apply only in certain cases? That's the media query we talked about. And that's what this part of the CSS rule right here says. Media equals only screen and minimum device width 601 pixels. Let me explain that to you. All right? Screen means a computer. All right? It doesn't mean, in other words, the, if I'm viewing this on a, on a mobile device, screen shouldn't be true. It should be considered a handheld. All right? So screen means a computer screen, not a handheld screen. What is the second part? Device minimum width, 601 pixels. Well, especially in the old days, some browser makers for mobile devices lied and claimed that they were computer screens. All right? So we have to put that in to say if it's a computer screen and it's not any bigger than 600 pixels wide, it's a phone pretending to be a computer screen. All right? So if we're going to read this, this is if we're on a computer screen <coughs> and we are not on a phone that's pretending to be a computer screen, then this style rule applies. All right. Now remember what we talked about earlier. It's possible to have two different sets of style rules that, that apply to a page. And the way it works when they're both external files is that the first one applies and then the stuff in the second one overrules the first one. So here we have our basic style sheet that is the mobile style sheet. The second one goes and overrules it. So if they're both external style sheets, then the position does matter. If one of them is internal and one's external, then the position doesn't matter as much. All right? But in this case, the browser first applies this style, then in some cases it applies this style. In what cases? Well, we're on a computer screen. Or we're on a phone pretending to be a computer screen. So let's look at these CSS files. The first CSS file, as you can imagine, is going to contain the stuff that's going to make it look this way. So. Body, font, family, Helvetica, Arial, sans serif. That's why in the mobile version it has that look. Header, width of 100%, border 1px, solid red, black, or solid black. Nav, blah, 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 nav. And section, width 100%. So this is a style sheet that gives you this look. The look that we want in a mobile device. Now notice that the last line is what hides the content. I say any images within the section tag, the display is none. What does display none mean? Well, it means it doesn't display it. So that's what hides the image. Because if we look at the HTML code for this, that image tag is there, but the style rule says that if it's an image inside a section, don't display it. So on the mobile version of this page, the image is not displayed. And we get this look. This makes the LIs orient horizontally, so our navigation is horizontal. This removes a bullet point. This sets everything of having a width of 100%. In other words, we're going to have a single column, which is typically what we want in a mobile environment. We then have our desktop CSS. This, this one here is not needed in this example. That was just a carryover. But this one, notice what it does. It has some of the same style rules as the base does. 
but it has different values. And again, because it appears second, those values take precedence over the values in the first style sheet. So, instead of body having a font family of Helvetica, Ariel, Sans Serif, the body has a font family of Garamond, Serif, and we have a background URL for the page. And we have a color of white instead of a color of black. So, let me go and hit refresh now that I've put back the second style sheet. And again, it looks different. Now, if we were to switch these around, we get something weird like this. Why is it? Well, because it did them in the opposite order. So the position does matter. You want the one that applies to everyone go first, and then you want the one that overrules it to go second. Because the one that overrules it you want it to have the last word. So you put it in last. So all the changes that I described, all the differences I described between the first one and the second one are contained in the second one CSS file. All the differences between the desktop and the mobile are in the desktop CSS file. So the body has text of white, has a background image, and has a different set of fonts. The navigation doesn't stretch all the way across the screen. It only goes 300 pixels across, and I'm floating it to the left. Nav LI has a display of block. So the navigation is not oriented horizontally, it's oriented vertically. A, I make the color white. Section, I also make white 30% minimum width and float to the left. And then finally, the images, I set a display of inline. So before in the mobile version, it had a display of none. So I have a display of N9 and a width of 100%. So as I make this smaller, the image gets smaller. Now again, since I'm floating, at a certain point, these will break down and go down to one column. That's one sort of nice feature of this. <coughs> if something happened where my media query didn't work right, this is what a mobile phone would get. And that's not really what I wanted to get, but it's also not horrible. All right? So that's the key to mobile development. All right? Um, and responsive development is to use more than one CSS file, but on one of the CSS files have a media query, so it only applies some of the time. By the way, this is the same thing you do if you have a print version of your page versus a uh, display version. A lot of times if you go, uh, for example, to a news site, uh, you can say print this article and it will open up the page in another window and you can go and print it. Well, usually the print version is more plain than the display version. It doesn't use colors and probably doesn't have images and so on. It's just the plain text. All that is is a different CSS file that applies. So you can use a print version, uh, a print CSS uh, file, just like you can use a mobile and a desktop. And again, all that would change would be the media query. You'd say, when I'm printing this document, use this as a style sheet. So that's another thing that you can use this for. So that is progressive enhancement. You enhance your web page. You define a bare bones mobile brow uh, browser version. Then you enhance it because typically you think of a desktop as having more stuff on the web page. You enhance it for a desktop version. What do you think graceful degradation is? The exact opposite. You start off and define in your base style sheet how you want the desktop version to look. And then you chip away from that in the second 
CSS file. Either way, you should end up with the same thing. All right, if you do it properly, you, you can end up with the same thing. It's just if you're going from mobile to desktop or from desktop to mobile. All right. The graceful degradation would be useful if you would, um, if you would, um, if you already had a website that worked in a desktop environment and you said, hey, I just want to make it more mobile compatible. All right. Whereas progressive enhancement is the way to go if you were starting from scratch. Now, if you paid close attention to this page, there are a couple of things um, that we uh, that, that that really don't have anything to do with mobile and desktop versions of the page. These are these things down here, and these are covered in the textbook. I forget on what page, but they're somewhere in the textbook. These things are done for browser compatibility. All right, so I don't want to forget about these things, but I'm not going to talk about them today. We'll talk about them in more detail. And we'll talk about graceful degradation in more detail next week on Thursday. Remember, you don't have class on the 4th of July. Remember, your design is due on Thursday. So Thursday, we're going to start off and sort of wrap up this unit. We're going to wrap up this unit by reviewing the graceful degradation example in a little more detail. Um, and then we are going to review uh, these things for browser compatibility. Uh, after that, we're going to start uh, a unit that I don't think is adequately covered in the textbook, and that is website accessibility. All right, that is, uh, well, that's part of the assignment for you to figure out what that is. But we'll talk about that in more detail in class on Thursday. Like I said, I always got to give a cliffhanger to want you to come back. All right. Are there any questions at this point? <coughs> all right, that's all I had. Have a good holiday if you're not coming to lab. Uh, if you are coming to lab, um, Still have a good holiday. All right, we'll see you there.